Good morning, Grace Alameda. Welcome to our Sunday online service. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. It says there, But the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Everywhere you look in God's creation, his glory is on display. God is calling us to take our place in his creation and sing his praises together this morning. So let's do that and begin with a word of prayer. Father God, your works are wondrous. Your name is holy. Your presence is with us in Christ by your Spirit. Please fill us with joy and gratitude this morning as we sing your praises together now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who all things so wondrously reigneth Shelters thee under his wings Yea, so gently sustaineth Hast thou not seen How all your longings have been Granted in what he ordained Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. If with his love he befriend thee Praise to the Lord and let all that is in me adore him All that hath life and breath come now with praises before him let the amen sound from his people again. Gladly for I we adore him. Let the amen sound from his people again. Gladly for I we adore Him. Let all things now living a song of thanksgiving to God the Creator. Triumphantly raised Who fashioned and made us Protected and stayed us Who still guides us on To the end of our days God's banners are o'er us His light goes before us A pillar of fire Shining forth in the night Till shadows have vanished and darkness is banished As forward we travel From light into light His law he enforced 
horses, the stars in their courses, the sun in its orbit, obediently shine. The hills and the mountains, the rivers and fountains, the deeps of the ocean, proclaim Him divine. We too should be voicing our love and rejoicing with glad adoration, a song that has raised to all things now living, united in thanksgiving to God in the highest, Hosanna and praise. Welcome again to Grace Alameda. My name is Jeff Locke, and I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, today, uh, just one quick announcement that after our service is over, uh, we will be having a Zoom fellowship time. Uh, the link should be in the description box of this YouTube video. Um, you can click there and join us after service for a time of fellowship, discussion, and just catching up together. So please join us for that. I want to encourage you as well to give your tithes and offerings to the Lord. There's a link in the description box as well where you can do that. Um, but we, we give back to God that which He has already given to us because of the grace He's poured out upon us in Christ Jesus. So let's take a moment, pray for our offering, and, and pray for our church and our community as well. Merciful Father, we offer to you that which you've already given to us. We give you our time, our possessions, and ourselves. We pray that you would receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, you are the one from whom every family on earth is named. We ask that you would continually care for the homes in which your people dwell. We pray that you would put far from them every root of bitterness, the desire of vain glory, and the pride of life. We ask that you would fill our homes with faith, with virtue, with knowledge, with self-control, patience, and true godliness. Please knit together in constant affection those who in holy matrimony have been united by you in one flesh. We pray that you would turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. We pray, Father, that you would so enkindle Christian love among us all that we may evermore be joined with one another in the bonds of loving kindness through the work of your Son. Almighty God, by your gift alone, we come to, to wisdom and true understanding. We ask, Lord, that you would look with favor on our schools as they prepare for the new school year. This is a strange year, Father, in which much instruction, at least at the start of the year, will, will be online. We pray, God, that, that you would increase knowledge among us, that, that there would be wholesome learning in our children, in our households, that, that they would flourish and abound in that. We pray as well, Father, that you would bless those who teach, you would bless those who learn. We pray that you would grant humility in heart, that they may ever look to you who are the fountain of all wisdom. Father God, you've taught us in your word that you do not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. We pray that you would look with pity on the sorrows of the people of Beirut today. In the light of the tragic explosion that occurred this week, please have mercy upon them. Remember them, O Lord, in your mercy. Hold those who are responsible for this to account. We pray, Father, that you would comfort those who are grieving. We pray that you would heal the wounded. We pray that you would house the homeless. Lift up the light of your countenance upon them, O Lord, and give them your peace. We pray through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Today's reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is God's word. The desert was hot. The sun was beating down on him. But he couldn't sweat. Because everyone was watching. Everyone was, was expectant. They were terrified. They were amazed. Everyone there was thanking their lucky stars that they were not Moses. You see, God had called Moses to meet him on the mountain at the top of Mount Sinai. And Moses knew the stories. He knew that no one could see God and live. And and yet here he was, climbing the mountain to meet with God, to see him. What was going to happen to him when he got there? Have you ever wondered what was in Moses' mind at the time as he climbed the mountain? I mean, maybe he was afraid of death as he walked the path that day. And maybe as as he thought that he was going to die, maybe he began thinking about all the ways that life had been unfair. Maybe he thought, you know, I didn't ask to be put in a basket in the Nile River as a baby. I didn't want to be adopted. I didn't want to lead this people, Israel. They're all so stubborn, they don't listen to me. I've nearly died for them multiple times. And still, they don't respect me. They don't listen. And now I have to go and face God for them on their behalf? Now maybe, maybe that wasn't Moses' mindset at all. Maybe as he was walking up the mountain, he was making plans. And when all this is over, I'm, I'm going to write it down. Write some Bible I'll be remembered forever by everyone. And when I get to the promised land, when when this is all over, I'm going to build a large house. I'm going to have a big estate, my own vineyard, drink my own wine. I'm going to rule over this people. I'm going to be like a king. But then again, maybe Moses' imagination wasn't filled with himself at all. Maybe he was praying to the God he was going to meet at the top of the mountain. Maybe he was preparing his heart to meet with God, cultivating humility, reverence, and wonder in his soul. Now, we don't know what was was in Moses' mind, but we do know that God transformed him God transformed him when he met with him on the mountain. That when when Moses came back down the mountain from seeing God, his face was shining with the afterglow of God's glory. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 3, verse 7, says that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory. Moses had to cover his face with a veil just to talk to his friends. The vision of God transformed Moses. Now, in our passage today in Philippians 4, 8, and 9, St. Paul is teaching us something about how we can be transformed too. We, 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 he, he didn't give us a map of how to get to the top of Mount Sinai. Instead, he's teaching us what he he says we should do in Romans 12, verse 2, to be transformed 
by the renewing of our minds. He says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, reflecting on Moses' time at the top of the mountain, that God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the question for us today is, how do we get there? How do we get to a place of, of seeing God, of, 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 of being transformed by his glory? Well, for one thing, we're, we're not going to get there if we're distracted. If we're distracted by the demands of the moment or the incessant pings of our smartphones, we will not arrive where, where Paul is leading us in our passage today. Now, in today's passage, Paul is, is taking aim at our imaginations. Paul's showing us how to be transformed by God's glory like, like Moses had been all those centuries before. Paul's telling us to, to ponder, to consider, to think about the things that will lead us to thinking about, to reflecting on, to meditating on God himself. See, Paul wants to fill up our imaginative lives with Christ Jesus by teaching us to meditate on him. Because as we'll see today from this passage, meditation manifests Christ in us. Meditation manifests Christ in us. In us. Now, in Philippians 4, 8, and 9, Paul is emphasizing the importance of our thought lives because he understands how human beings work, how we're made. He knows, first of all, that you are what you imagine, that you are what you imagine. I want you to think for a moment, imagine. Imagine your imagination as an empty house. And, and that house is, is filled with all different kinds of rooms, each room representing something that you think about regularly. There's a room for your family and your thoughts about your family. There's a room for work. There's a room for your future. But every one of these rooms in your imaginative house is, is empty. If you want to sit down and ponder any of the things in those rooms, you need some furniture. You need a place to sit down or to lay out. Where's your imaginative furniture going to come from? What will shape your imagination? What decorates your thought life? See, the, the call of Christ is all-encompassing for us. Paul says in another, another passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We're supposed to do everything to God's glory. If every room in your imaginative home is supposed to reflect the glory of God, then, then we need a, a very specific home furnishing catalog to do so. And, and I think we get a clue of what that's supposed to look like in Psalm 119, verse 11. Where David writes there, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, if we want to live in a way where we're doing everything for God's glory, we need to get our imaginative furniture from God's Word. Our imaginations need to be furnished with the Word of God. We need to furnish our minds, our thoughts, our wills, our desires from the treasure house of God in His Scriptures. Because the fact is that your imaginative life dictates how you see the world and how you live in it. Paul's telling us in, in Philippians 4 that holiness and devotion don't just happen to us. 
he's saying that we need a disciplined, determined approach to our imaginations. That we need to think, ponder, consider, meditate upon God, what he has made and what he has done. Because if, as he walked up Mount Sinai, Moses' mind had been focused on how unfair his life had been or how afraid of death he was or, or what he would accomplish in his future, his imagination would have been furnished from the same source. His imagination would have been furnished from himself. And more than anything else, we are encouraged by the world around us to fill our minds with ourselves. Our world cultivates an imagination centered on the self. We say things like, you do you, or live your truth. I think that the choice for us is plain. You can either fill your imagination with yourself, or you can fill it with something greater and higher than yourself. Because an imagination centered on self can't conceive of the goodness of being in the presence of the divine. An imagination captivated by the self can't conceive of encountering love himself, of, of, of seeing peace personified, of, of coming face to face with the burning goodness and truth that is the beauty of the God of the universe. See, Scripture teaches that, that all of us, in a sense, are our Moses walking up the mountain. Each step we take in life, each moment that passes by, is one step further up the mountain, closer to seeing the face of God. In the end, everyone will see God. The question isn't whether we'll see God or not. The question is whether that vision of God is going to do something good to us or whether it's going to break us apart completely. See, if we belong to God as his dearly beloved children, then, then seeing God will be like receiving a loving embrace that overwhelms the senses, that boggles the mind, that gives us access to pleasures forevermore. If we don't belong to him, if we have not been transformed by him through faith in Christ and the power of his spirit, then no one seeing God and living will apply to us. Seeing God will unmake you. Seeing God will seem tortuous to you. It'll become your worst nightmare. The vision of the God you defied will be hell itself. And that's why Paul is so insistent about what we should think about. It's because you are what you imagine. And Paul had done that work when he meditated on God in the face of Jesus Christ. He saw God himself. He saw God becoming a servant, God emptying himself, God submitting himself even to death on a cross. That's why Paul says what he does in Ephesians 3, verse 8. We looked at a few weeks back. He says, that I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Paul had lost everything that the world has to offer. At this point in his life, as he's writing from prison, he had suffered multiple imprisonments. He'd been beaten. He'd been tortured. He'd been stoned. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd been abandoned, betrayed, 
and depressed. Paul had gone down to the depths of suffering for the sake of Christ. And now he could say, whatever you've seen in me, do that. That's what he says essentially in verse 9. He could say that not as an egotist. He could say it instead as a realist. Egotism in Paul would say, look at my accomplishments. Look at all the things I've done. But realism makes Paul say, Look at everything I've suffered. A realistic look at everything Paul has suffered allows him to say, I have nothing left of my own. Whatever I have, whatever I am, it's all what Christ has done in me. That's why he says what he does in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How could Paul come to that conclusion? Well, in verse 8, where he's telling us what we're supposed to think about, He's teaching us the path up the mountain to deeper meditation on God in Christ. And having meditated on Christ in all of these things, Paul has become more like Christ. And Paul is teaching us the way to do the same. He's teaching us that meditation manifests Christ in us. Because Everything he lists in this verse can be found in creation in some manner. I mean, Psalm 19, verse 1, our call to worship today, said the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We can look at the beauty of what God has created and we can, we can stand in awe. We can, we can be amazed by it. But we also have to recognize that behind creation is something far greater. Creation was made through the Word of God. And the Word of God is Christ Jesus himself. In Christ, the creative principle that stands behind everything in the universe has come to us. He's revealed himself as a person. He's poured out upon us grace upon grace. See, meditating on all of these good and true and beautiful things in creation leads us to meditating on Jesus himself. Paul says in in Philippians 4, verse 8, first of all, that we should think about whatever is true. And, And to people in his culture at that time, Truth was a contested thing. To most people in that world, they would have heard truth and and thought immediately of of some kind of an abstract principle, an an idea that everybody's hoping to discover. But what Paul is proclaiming here and elsewhere is the doctrine of the incarnation of the Son of God, that God has become flesh in Jesus Christ. Christ. And the incarnation makes the idea of abstract truth totally beside the point. What God has demonstrated in the incarnation is that truth is not an abstraction. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. We discover truth himself when we come to know the Lord Jesus. Paul goes on to list all manner of things in verse 8. Whatever is honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and worthy of praise. And we get to see Jesus fulfilling all of these adjectives in the praise song of Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10 say this. Worthy are you 
to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Why do they praise the Lord Jesus? They say he's worthy, he's honorable. Because he fulfilled justice itself by being slain for the sake of his people. Jesus could fulfill justice because he is the Lamb of God, the spotless one, pure and lovely, beautiful and without blemish. He is commendable. He is worthy. As they go on to sing in verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. Towards the end of his list, Paul says, if there is any excellence, and he uses the Greek word arete, and that word was used in Paul's day to describe greatness. It's an ancient Greek word goes all the way back to Homer and his writing about Achilles in the Iliad. Achilles was arete. He was the greatest soldier of his day. The, the most beautiful woman, the most accomplished athlete, the most famous and greatest people in society all had arete. And you became that. You became arete through striving, through competition, through determination and skill. But that idea, that idea of arete, of excellence, has found both its fulfillment and its inversion in the Lord Jesus. Because excellence for Paul does not mean being at the top of your game, being the best of the best. No, excellence for Paul counts all of his, his, his worthly, earthly accomplishments, his worldly accomplishments in excellence, he counts all those things as, as, as rubbish. Because excellence, the excellence of Christ, is made most perfectly manifest in his sacrificial death on the cross. Excellence for the disciple of Jesus, excellence looks like death. It looks like self-sacrifice. It looks like dying to self. And that dying to self is true life in God. So I want you to ask yourself today, what is it that, that fills and captures your imagination? When you have downtime, when you're alone, what do you think of? What are your daydreams filled with? The next vacation? What you're going to do when when the IPO happens or your stock options invest? What fills your imagination? Paul is telling us today to let our imaginations be filled with Christ. Christ. He calls us to to ponder, consider, meditate on the principles embedded in the world around us. He calls us to meditate on them and see the ways that they find their, their goal, their climax in Christ. We're being called by God himself to consider him who is the truth, to contemplate him for whom excellence means self-emptying, self-giving, self-sacrificing even to death on the cross. I want to encourage you to meditate on these things. And as you do, watch what happens. Watch the way that your approach to life and others begins to shift. When you meditate on the fact that that excellence means self-giving, then you'll begin to to put your energy into loving God and other people above yourself. When you meditate on these things, you'll, you'll begin to see your meditation bear fruit. Your meditation 
will manifest Christ. That day, on top of the mountain, Moses did not die on Mount Sinai. No, he came back down with his face shining with the glory of God. His contemplation of the divine led him to literally radiate God to everyone around him. That is a model of what the Christian life is supposed to be like. I want to encourage you today to meditate on these things and their fulfillment in Christ. Because you'll manifest Christ as you do. And as you do that, the promise at the end of verse 9 will come true for you. That the peace of God will be with you. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our imaginations with the things of Christ Jesus. Teach us to put off the things that would distract us or keep us from pursuing you above all things. Give us a desire for Christ and let us know that peace, that joy, that rest, that true pleasure is found in him. Let us put off the things that would entangle us and strive for the goal of knowing our Lord in whom your glory shines upon us in grace. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to confess our sins to God, I'm going to read from Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13. It says, Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. One reason that God calls us to meditate is that we aren't even aware of all the ways we've sinned and strayed from him. So let's take the time now to confess our sins before God, asking his forgiveness for even those things we're not aware of. Let's pray. Our assurance of God's forgiveness to us in Christ comes from Psalm 19, 13, and 14. It says, Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Only through the work of Jesus Christ, who is our rock, and our Redeemer, can we be made acceptable to God. If you've hidden yourself in Christ by faith today, you are forgiven, cleansed, and redeemed. Let's rejoice in that truth as we sing this last song. Oh Lord my God, Yeah. 
Today's benediction, God's blessing on us as people, comes from Philippians chapter 4, verse 23. It says there, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. May God bless you with his abundant grace. May he be with you in the deepest part of who you are. And may you have a blessed and wonderful Sunday.